Hello, I'm Paula Holderman, President of the Illinois State Bar Association. All of us have heard the phrase rule of law tossed about, but what does it mean? If you put rule of law into your web browser, you'll find the following definition. That individuals, persons, and government shall submit to, obey, and be regulated by law, and not arbitrary action by an individual or a group of individuals. Today, we'll explore the rule of law and why it matters to the citizens of this country. As retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said, it matters enormously to a successful democratic society like ours that we have three branches of government, each with some independence and some control over the other two. That's set out in the Constitution. Today, we have some eminently qualified guests to help guide us through the discussion. So to begin, I'll turn the program over to our moderator, Justice Ann Jorgensen of the Illinois Appellate Court. Hello, my name is Ann Jorgensen. I am a judge of the Illinois Appellate Court, 2nd District. And welcome today to our discussion on the rule of law. Today joining me is Jim Holderman, former Chief Judge of the Federal Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Also joining me is Chief Justice Thomas Kilbride, Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. We hear the term rule of law tossed about. John Adams, our second president, reminds us that we are a government of law, not of men. Chief Justice Kilbride, we'll start with you. <laughs> Tell our audience what is meant by the term rule of law. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, your opening statement about the definition of rule of law was really right on target. And as a practical matter, what it means is that my good friend here, uh, Judge Jim Holderman, as much as you and I both like him and respect him, he doesn't get to decide cases based on his personal bias or preferences or, or wishes or desires, but operates as a judge. And we all know this as judges within the confines of the existing law that's on the books, whether it's statute books or in case law, case law precedent. And I think it also means a lot of things to a lot of different people, unfortunately. And even with a quick review of some of the, the you know, I think you mentioned do a Google search or something like that in the opening line. I did one of those, and there's a lot of different statements mm -hmm. about it. So it, but, but at its core, it just means, uh, I shouldn't say it just means, but it does mean being bound and to follow law and not the, the wishes and preferences of individuals. Judge Holderman, <clears throat> can you explain how you apply that in your obligations and duties as a judge? Absolutely. The, the rule of law requires that no one be above the law. And so uh, everyone uh, should be treated equally under the law. And so uh, we have to uh, treat uh, everyone the same, apply the law in the same way. Everyone has the same rights and responsibilities under the law. And so as a, uh, as a federal trial judge, uh, it's my job uh, when people come before me uh, to uh, uh, impart that, uh, to uh, show everyone respect, courtesy, and civility, uh, so that there is a respect for the law and a respect for the concept that everyone is treated equally under the law. Judge, would you agree with that? Oh, I always agree with whatever he has to say. <laughs> Do you think you're, that the role of the rule of law, as it's been described in the trial court, does that change when a case goes on to appeal? Well, not, not really. I mean, it, it really has to play out the same way. I mean, the trial judge, as you know, and, and in your position on an appellate court, you see this as much as I do, that to, we have to decide again within the confines of the statutes that apply in a given case and the common law precedent. So I don't think it really changes. Judge Holderman? Yes. Well, in the, uh, in the trial court, since a lot of people, uh, their only experience with the law is in a trial court, uh, whether it be a state mm -hmm. court or a federal court. And so uh, we, and trial judges, have the additional responsibility of imparting to the people who are there before us, who see mm -hmm. us, who see us apply the law, that we are applying the law in an equal, fair, and open way. Uh, and, and so... Um, uh, to some extent, there's a little difference not in the, uh, in, in the application of the rule of law, but the way that it's delivered to the citizenry. 
In the trial court, you're uh, emphasizing what I think judges of, and courts of review are always lamenting, and that is that the trial judge makes specific findings and say that this is why I'm reaching the conclusion that I'm reaching. Would you expound on that, perhaps? Sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's our job to find the facts, to judge the credibility of uh, witnesses, to uh, make a determination that is fair based upon the facts, based upon the record before us. And frankly, uh, that is all a part of the rule of law. Plus, there's an additional responsibility to not be influenced by any outside uh, interests, uh, mm -hmm. politically, uh, popular belief. Uh, that, that is a concept that actually carries through the entire uh, the judiciary from the uh, lowest uh, uh, trial judge, uh, like myself, of the federal courts, up to the Supreme Court of the United States. Justice Kilbride, when, um, when the court, the Supreme Court, issues its written opinions, different from a trial court where it's usually done orally to the, uh, the members of both sides that are present, almost always present in court, or even to a jury explaining things. Um, how do you accomplish that to explain the rule of law to the parties in your written decisions? Well, <clears throat> hopefully well <laughs> is the short answer. <laughs> but uh, again, as you know, the opinions are issued in a way that sets forth the, the body of facts that apply in a given case and mm -hmm. a review of the applicable case law. And I think that really shows the guidepost on how the court reasons its way mm -hmm. to a final conclusion. So the body of precedent, again, whether it's uh, state statutes, federal statutes in a federal case, or just the common law precedent of the state of Illinois, has to be laid out and reasoned to, to reach the final conclusion. So I think that's the way it's communicated in written form. Now, our statutes can be amended from time to time, but does the rule of law really ever change? Well. The rule of law, the, the basic concept uh, that no one is above the law, that the law must be applied open, equally, and fairly, that never changes. Our human perceptions of what those concepts are have changed. Uh, in fact, the uh, quote that you read uh, in the opening statement talked about all men. Well, uh, in this day and age, uh, that, would, that would seem um, uh, inappropriate uh, because, uh, frankly, it should be all people. Uh, there's no uh, uh, discrimination in any way, and there should be no discrimination in any way under the rule of law. Uh, I, I want to also mention that, uh, of course, the Court of Appeals uh, have the obligation, when they're making a decision, to consider the entire application of the law. I have the benefit as a trial judge to only have to focus on the, uh, the case before me, uh, the law and the, the facts that are before me. Uh, but uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Chief Justice, Tom Kilbride and the other, his other colleagues on the Illinois Supreme Court have the obligation to consider what should the law be across the state of Illinois. And that's an additional obligation to the rule of law that, that I don't have as a trial judge. Judge, would you like to discuss that, the policy considerations in some of your decisions? Right. Well, every case that makes its way to the Illinois Supreme Court is not there in its limited capacity just to resolve that one dispute. I mean, the, the, the whole selection process of what are called the formal uh, petitions for leave to appeal, the request to take a case, mm -hmm. we take them based on the importance of, of the issue presented in a case and how it will impact uh, the court system, the bench and the bar and their practice. Um, but, I, you know, we really don't have the liberty to just set policy. I mean, where our hands are tied, again, within the confines of, of the precedent that's, that comes to us in a case mm -hmm. and the state statutes in Illinois. But there are issues of first impression and judgments that have to be made. But I think as a court, we all respect the institution and we want to take uh, incremental steps in, in evolving the law. So we really don't get to make the law, but we're interpreting the law. And then your decisions uh, passed down to the appellate court and appellate decisions to the trial judges in the state court as well as the federal court. And that becomes the guidepost for future decisions. And that um, is the, really the evolution of the rule of law. Chief Justice, I'd like to ask you how you see that interplaying with uh, the concept of access to justice. Well, <clears throat> that's a really tough question because it's a, a loaded question. Not that you intended it that way, but that phrase itself I think means a lot of things to a lot of different people and it's a relatively newer phrase being used uh, with, with for example the American Bar Association has been promoting 
access to justice. And a year ago, our Illinois Supreme Court established a commission on the access to justice. I think at the time we were the 27th state, and there might be 29 states that now have commissions. So, um, and it's playing out in a variety of ways. And just to give you a few quick examples, one is the language access uh, requirements that, that come out of uh, the federal civil rights statutes that are actually 40 years old. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think, and I don't know because I'm not in the federal courts, but I think they probably do a better job across the board than, than many of our state courts across the nation do in making our court system accessible to those who do not speak English as their primary language. And the law refers to uh, people, I think the phrase is limited, LP, limited proficiency. or Right, English. limited language proficiency. Yes, right. right. And um, so, I mean, that's one thing we're looking at. We're looking also at, uh, and I know you're a, a big fan of judicial education for judges and we're working with uh, Chief Judge Mike Sullivan in McHenry County on uh, developing training to how to work with judges, to train them on how to manage, how to handle the flood of self-represented litigants who are coming more and more into our, our state courts. And I don't know what the numbers are like in, in the federal court system, but in the state court, there's really a flood. And, and that's a real access issue. When people are there unrepresented, uh, it's hard to uh, speak the language of the court system. Whether you're, that's your primary language is English, or uh, even more so if you you have another uh, primary language. Judge Holderman, do you have uh, an issue with people who are unrepresented? Yes, we do. And in fact, it's uh, becoming more difficult to uh, fill those uh, responsibilities that we as a court have because of the uh, absence of funding, the cutting of funds. Uh, we have a federal defender program uh, in the Northern District of Illinois. It's actually one of the first federal defender programs in the United States where we have a full-time uh, federal defender uh, panel uh, and then a, a panel of, uh, of uh, lawyers who are on call to uh, take on the responsibility to represent uh, indigent uh, individuals charged with uh, federal offenses. The funding for those organizations has been cut and cut again uh, by Congress. It is a very difficult situation. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but it is an access to justice uh, problem simply because if we can't provide the constitutional uh, obligations, can't provide for the constitutional uh, rights that uh, those individuals mm -hmm. have, we cannot provide any justice. Uh, and so consequently, it, it really has become a problem of late in the federal courts. So you're talking about um, the criminal courts, uh, where those charged with a, an offense, right. and they are entitled under our Constitution to representation. You're absolutely right. And you're suggesting that it's, uh, there just aren't enough lawyers to go around? Well, they keep cutting the funding of the lawyers. So the, the, the lawyers in uh, private practice who are willing to provide uh, uh, their services, uh, their uh, ability to, it, it, it's now become almost exclusively or close to pro bono. Uh, and they keep cutting the funding of the lawyers who are hired to be full-time public defenders or federal defenders, mm -hmm. and that has become uh, difficult because they keep cutting that funding as well. When that occurs and there is a shortage of attorneys who can represent, who are able and funded to represent indigents, what happens in the trial courts? We have to delay uh, until we can get lawyers uh, into the courtroom to assist us. Isn't now, that in a, just on its face a denial of access to justice? Absolutely. It's mm -hmm. certainly a denial of uh, access to speedy justice. Uh, and uh, no, we, haven't, we aren't at that point yet. Uh, but I, uh, I see it coming down the road if uh, the trend that uh, has uh, carried out over the past few months continues. What about some of the other aspects in the trial court? Uh, is probation fully funded? Is your clerk's office fully funded? The answer is no. Uh, we've had to uh, face the uh, problem of uh, furloughing some of our uh, probation officers who are in charge of uh, both uh, people who uh, are awaiting a trial or, or awaiting sentencing or awaiting uh, uh, their uh, uh, time to uh, go to prison or are on supervised release after they return from prison. 
those uh, people, if uh, our uh, individuals, our probation officers are furloughed, are unsupervised. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, the public is at risk. Do we see similar trends in the state court? Oh, absolutely. It's sort of a parallel <clears throat> to what uh, Chief Judge, former Chief Judge Holderman, I'm so used to referring to you as the <laughs> Chief Judge, uh, talked about in the federal system. Our court, state court system in the state of Illinois, it's no secret. Uh, the budget is in financial disarray, so to speak. And uh, mm -hmm. our courts, for at least a decade now, have suffered year after year after year of cutbacks. And, uh, but despite that, uh, this past legislative session, we were able to get a modest bump up increase in the overall budget uh, with about 16 million, I think that was the number, tagged or targeted for probation, because probation has taken the biggest hit. And uh, as we all know, the critical role that probation workers serve in assisting the court system on proper dispositions of sentences in criminal cases. And also, it, it's, it's, it's like financial insanity with what's going on in the federal court system. The federal budget, I don't know your numbers, but I do know the percentages, it's, it's infinitesimal in the amount of the overall budget. Same is true with the Illinois court system. We're not even one half of 1% of the entire budget in the state of Illinois, and most citizens wouldn't know that. And they, I think they'd be shocked to know that, that the court's one-third equal branch of government doesn't even get 1% of the, the state budget to run our court system. And uh, it really, it, it, here's why it's insane. If you take somebody who's not a violent criminal, somebody who should be properly supervised and, and involved in community release programs and so forth, you keep, keep them on probation. It might be on average about $3,200, maybe it was 23, I can't remember. It's, it's like 23000 to hold them in the Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do that on thousands and thousands of individuals, even class four felons, we're talking millions of dollars that the state could save if they were properly funding, spending money where it needs to get done in the court system, whether it's the federal court system or the state court system. And in the state courts, we're also seeing um, when uh, public defender's offices, state attorney's offices are not fully funded, that there is a lag. Cases just don't mm -hmm. move as quickly. Um, and on, in courts of review, sometimes we see where corners were cut in criminal cases, um, it, bringing the case to trial either because we didn't have enough investigators, didn't have enough attorneys. Do you see that happen? Well, sure it happens. But, uh, you know, the kinds of cases that get to us, uh, if it were a, a targeted issue, we might not take the case unless it's something massive across uh, the board that's a systemic kind of thing. So uh, we really get more of the, as you know, the questions of law that, uh, that are on our docket that impact the, uh, the ultimate decision in the case. But we really, I, I don't think we've seen recently cases that have come to make that argument that uh, uh, on an ineffective assistance of counsel claim, for example. Do you see anything like that in the federal courts? Not yet. But again, as I've uh, said, if the trend continues, there's that possibility and, and we all should be concerned about that. It's a, not only an access to justice, it's us providing justice uh, once uh, people are uh, before us. I think we all see that many of our assets, limited as they may be, do go to the criminal courts. What about in the civil courts where um, we may have issues with access to justice? Have you seen anything like that? Yeah, and if I, before I answer that, if, if I've got the question right, I wanted to back up to something that uh, sure. uh, we discussed earlier about the trend and so forth. In state court, in Missouri and in Florida now, and this is on the criminal side, uh -huh. uh, the public defenders as a group made claims to the court that we simply cannot effectively represent mm -hmm. individuals. And they did you know, the case studies of, of how much time it takes to do each piece of a criminal case and the number of public defenders available in both the Florida courts and Missouri courts have, have issued rulings saying that they've got the right to refuse to take additional caseload because they can't properly handle the ones they have. And, and it's the whole issue of the trend. And, right. and you know how that's going to play out is the problem. Where's the money to provide the additional public defenders? I mean, the money's in the budget. It's a question of priority. Yeah, allocating it to the, the mm -hmm. uh, proper re resources. Right. And that's what I was kind of alluding to mm -hmm. is there is the whole other side of our court system uh, our domestic relations, traditional civil litigation. Um, can you discuss some of the issues with respect to access to justice for our civil courts? 
Well, again, I think the probably the the key part is the number of individuals coming into our courts because of the economy that can't afford lawyers. And I, I know there's, and I don't want to make fun of this or light of it, but uh, uh, one of our lawyers who's involved with the Access to Justice Commission, his secretary said to him, I can't afford you as a lawyer if I needed to go to court. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people who were working class, had, from middle class families, mm -hmm. had good jobs, are, are not capable of really paying the freight anymore. And I think we as a court system need to look at uh, the kinds of issues that come in, do they need to be litigated in the same way they have in the past? Does every case have to be litigated with, with uh, volumes and volumes of discovery? And that's not necessarily the case all the time, but we do have small claims court. Maybe we need to put more kinds of cases, categories of cases that aren't that complex into a forum within the court system that doesn't make it so difficult to get through. And we're trying to do in Illinois something uh, that all the other states have done except Mississippi and us, and that's a body of uniform court forms that you as an individual, if you were not a lawyer, could walk in and say, okay, I want to, this kind of relief versus that. And, and I don't want the lawyers upset. We're not trying to take any work away mm -hmm. from the lawyers. But uh, how do you navigate your way through the court system and w with the use of forms that are simple to fill out? And in fact, one of our committees is working on this with one of the law schools in town on language from an English standpoint, and then translated, of course, but, but at the sixth grade reading level, so mm -hmm. that the language in these forms are readable and understandable, because not everybody who walks into court on a case has a college degree. Of course, that's, you know, that's <clears throat> so true. Um, how does that really tie back to the rule of law in that it, I would suggest, it makes it simple. It explains the rule of law to our, really, for those who, for whom the rule of law was designed, that is, members of the public and our citizenry. Is that one of the um, objects? Absolutely, and if I may, uh, it's all right to refer to you as Jim. It's all right. <laughs> when you said earlier about the, the rule of law being applied equally, mm -hmm. the point is that's the concept. And it's, as, as Jim said, it's the application is the real kicker here. And if you can't navigate your way through the system, you don't have a lawyer, and you don't understand the system, you can't even find where the, 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 the courtroom is. I mean, there's people uh, who have trouble just finding their way in the, in the courthouse, and then they're defaulted. Uh, I mean, so we've got folks even working on not just forms, but uh, what's called a justice corps. Uh, that uh, is a group, I'll give you an example. Yeah, I think you know Chief Judge Elizabeth Robb down in McLean County. I do. Uh, they have a justice corps program with a group of students from Illinois State University and one lawyer who helps people, w when they walk in the door, they can find folks. And I think they've had some of this... Uh, even in the federal court system with help desks and so forth, yes. to navigate people, to, to show them where to go, self-help law centers, for example, with the county law library. And it's just an amazing concept to help people work their way through the court system. And the judges tell us it saves time, it moves cases, they don't have to continue as much because folks are able to find out the resources and, and the uh, group called Illinois Legal Aid Online, a magnificent organization that provides a ton of materials to help people, again, in basic, simple, understandable uh, language on how to, how to do whatever they need to do in the court system. And again, that's not to take good legal work away from the lawyers who uh, need to keep their market going. I practiced law for 20 years, and I'm, I'm still uh, a big fan of uh, the practitioners. Oh, I think we'll all agree that there will always be a place for lawyers because it is, uh, after all, the lawyers that keep and guard the rights of all our citizenry. Is that um, a similar thing going on in the federal courts? Yes, and uh, I have to say about lawyers, we are very fortunate in the state of Illinois, both in the state and the federal courts, to have the outstanding lawyers that we do who are willing to take on the responsibilities pro bono, especially on the civil side. Uh, unlike uh, the criminal side, uh, where uh, we actually have federal defenders or public defenders and uh, we, we can pay some, uh, on, the, on the civil side, when there's an individual who is indigent but yet has a claim, an appropriate claim uh, to be brought in federal or state court, there are lawyers who are willing to take on that case pro bono. Uh, we are very fortunate in the Northern District of Illinois to have a couple of programs that lawyers volunteer for. We have our Settlement Assistance Program, where uh, uh, an indigent uh, plaintiff uh, uh, can uh, obtain the uh, uh, help of an attorney for the limited purpose of seeing if the case can be resolved. 
an attorney who can talk to the attorney on the other side, talk to the attorney for the defendant who usually is funded, and uh, see if the, the matter can be resolved. We have a, a mm -hmm. number of uh, people who have uh, been willing to take on that responsibility, and it has worked out very well. Uh, we also have, uh, as, as Tom, if you don't mind me no, calling you Tom, yeah. uh, as, as Tom mentioned, uh, we have a self-help desk, uh, mm -hmm. and actually it was uh, started by uh, uh, one of our uh, former colleagues who has now passed away, uh, William J. Hibbler. We call it the William J. Hibbler Self-Assistance uh, mm -hmm. Desk. Uh, it's funded by uh, uh, law organizations, and lawyers uh, uh, come and make themselves available to uh, individual pro se plaintiffs or defendants, uh, indigent people on either side of the civil uh, justice system, uh, to assist them in understanding the law. Uh, they don't go into court and represent them. Uh, they don't uh, negotiate with the other side, unlike the settlement assistance program. But they do provide that uh, knowledge that uh, Tom was talking about, that, that people need to really have a, a, a full application of the rule of law. It's got to be open, it's got to be equal, and it's got to be fair. Uh, and that's what the rule of law requires. It sounds to me like, like what you both talked about with lawyers and or other organizations just helping people navigate the system is really the application of the rule of law in its finest hour. What else can the state courts do to support the rule of law? Well, not to be redundant on this, but obviously funding for the court system is probably the number one priority. Uh, but I, I think it's a combination of factors. The lawyer organizations and the Illinois State Bar Association, Chicago Bar Association, a variety of other county bar associations mm -hmm. are already engaged in a lot of discussions with our Access to Justice Commission on how we can, for, for example, uh, on, do a better job of getting lawyers into the court on pro bono. I know Jim's talked about their magnificent program having federal court that's mm -hmm. probably better than what we're able to do, and I think to some degree uh, with the uh, how your rules work, you're able to get you get more volunteers than we do. Right. Uh, but we're, we're exploring those kinds of things with lawyers on what makes sense and how to do it. Uh, next week we're going to have a meeting with uh, a group of general counsels of the corporations, the big uh, corporations in the state of Illinois, primarily, uh, uh, and, but not necessarily in Chicago. Daryl Bradford, who's the general counsel at Exelon, uh, their group won one of the five national awards for pro bono from the American Bar Association this summer. And he's volunteered to chair a committee of general counsels to talk about how corporations, through their in-house counsel uh, uh, law departments, for example, can be more b uh, helpful and supportive. And also to think about, because there's, there's another issue on, on the rule of law, and that is that uh, that's how businesses, you know, you talk about money, you talk about what makes sense. Businesses depend upon the rule of law. The economy depends upon the rule of law. Uh, the resolution of disputes in a, in a civilized and speedy fashion, to right. use your phrase earlier, mm -hmm. uh, is not just something that's important for criminal defendants, and it's absolutely important for them, right. but it's also true for businesses. And I know in conversations with the Chief Justice out in Oregon, I, I believe I've got the right state, where Nike's uh, mm -hmm. home base is, Nike Corporation has become the big fan, the big supporter of the court system because they're sued in state court they have contract disputes, they have all kinds of things, but they know how important the court system is to their business. And they know that sometimes they're going to win, sometimes they're going to lose. They're not trying to become, uh, you know, the, the, the courts to be the friend of the corporation, but they understand for the marketplace, for the business. And that's something uh, I'm hoping that if any legislators listen to this need to understand that it's not just us individually want this, but, but the community is a large. Mm -hmm. Because we have a live in a society where our disputes are resolved peacefully, not with guns and, and knives in the street, but in the courtroom with the, the battle of the, the courtroom contest. And businesses need to have a reliable, dependable a court system that is based on the rule of law. And a rule of law that is consistently applied. Exactly. Judge Holderman? Well, uh, I can only echo what uh, Tom has said. Uh, he hit the nail right on the head. Uh, and frankly, it is important to all of society, all of the people of the United States, uh, and I include all the corporations. <laughs> I was just uh, thinking when you said we're not going to be corporation friendly. Well, that would be contrary to the rule of law. Right. Uh, we're going to apply the law equally to all people, uh, all entities, in the same manner. 
And th in that way, we will be able to provide the justice and provide the, the rule of law and apply the rule of law as it should be applied. I'm going to throw a question to you. What happens if our society stops valuing the rule of law? Well, I think we're all going to suffer. I mean, I, I really don't know how that would play out in a real life uh, scenario. It would be awful. I mean, to not. I mean, I, oh. I think we as citizens, for example, and the whole idea of, of our government is that we've uh, conceded, consented to let the legislatures establish law, to let the U.S. Supreme Court be the final arbiter of, uh, through our U.S. Constitution, to, to settle the, what the law is in the, in the land. And unless people believe in that and accept it, and I think people do, although many times they might be unhappy, with court decisions and so forth. They, they think a judge has gone off the reservation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But uh, it would be awful. I, I really don't know how to explain it in, in more sophisticated terms. Well, Judge, we all have heard um, people leaving a courtroom who've lost, but feel they were heard, right. and they understood what, why the judge did what he or she did. Uh, how does that play into well, and, the rule and, of law? And that is the objective, uh, certainly, of the trial courts, because that's Typically, it's the trial courts that the people are there in the courtroom, right. uh, seeing that, uh, uh, that seeing the justice that's applied, uh, and so uh, that is important. Uh, to comment on your last question about uh, what would happen if uh, the rule of law weren't, uh, or people lost weren't respect valued. for the law, weren't valued, uh, there would have to be a change. Uh, in, in fact, I was uh, in 2011 uh, in Taiwan. And they were in the process of changing their criminal justice system uh, from an investigatory system uh, where the judge is uh, more of an investigator and mm -hmm. somewhat of a prosecutor to the adversary system that we have in the United States where the judge is a neutral, the prosecutor has an obligation, the defense has an obligation. And the reason they were changing their law and they were mm -hmm. uh, applying the laws of uh, the United States to some extent in, in making their changes, uh, the reason they were changing it is because people were losing respect for the law and the way it was applied. Uh, and there were some traditions uh, that, that had to go. Uh, for example, uh, people of a certain stature uh, in, uh, in society didn't even have to take an oath to testify. Hmm. And, and so uh, that was done away with. Cross-examination uh, of uh, the government's witnesses in a criminal case uh, by defense counsel. Uh, that wasn't uh, something that was uh, uh, applied uniformly. And, and so people lost respect. And so changes have to be made because our whole obligation is to provide service to society. And with the society rule of law? Yeah, with the rule of law. It right. applies to every person, no right. matter who you are, where you come from, or right. where you're going. Equally, absolutely. Gentlemen, I'd, I'd like to ask your final thoughts on the rule of law and something you'd like to impart to uh, the general public that is really our audience today about the rule of law, what it means to you. Oh, I'll let you know, no, no, you go, first. you go. <laughs> well, my, uh, uh, my feeling is uh, I'm any, anywhere I started, which is uh, the rule of law needs to be applied openly, fairly, and equally. Uh, and uh, we in the justice system need to keep that in mind at all times and hopefully uh, be able to apply the law in that way. Well, I, uh, it, it's, it's always the devil's in the details, how to get things done from, to get from point A to point Z. And, you know, our Constitution, and I, I think that's, that's something that we need to do a better job in this country of teaching students good, solid civic education. And uh, when you look at the Constitution, the opening line about we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, before they talked about a military before they talked about domestic tranquility. The number one thing was establish justice. Mm -hmm. And that's how the rule of the law plays out, is to establish justice. But it's, it's, it's all the, in the application, in the final analysis. And uh, it just takes a lot of hard work, and it takes good leader, leadership across the judiciary and the, and the state bar associations, county bar associations, and so forth. And we've got to recruit this guy to help us more in the state court system oh. with ideas, <laughs> with ideas. <Okay. laughs> And we've already met with your successor, uh, Chief Judge Castillo, who's Great. very helpful, and Judge Rebecca Palmer, I believe that's how you pronounce Both it. Both excellent yeah. judges. Yeah. Well, I think uh, our rule of law has done well over the, your past term as the former Chief Justice of the Federal Court. 
and Justice Kilbride, your term will be ending in just a, a few weeks. But you have both uh, really led the charge to ensure that the rule of law is ensconced and remains in its place of value in the state of Illinois. And I, as a citizen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today.